Well, good morning, Riverside. How are you? Good. Do you enjoy that time of worship? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you would, take out your bulletin or your phone where your notes are on your phone, something like that, something you can kind of write and make some notes. I want you to pull that out for just a second. I want you to think to a time when you really felt that you worshiped. A time when you really felt, you know what, I experienced the presence of God. I was in a moment of worship. I was in a time of worship. And I want you to write down on that piece of paper and just jot down in your notes on your phone, wherever you are, just a couple of things that you remember about that moment of worship and that place in worship where you were and write down some of the characteristics, what it was like when you were in that moment. For some of you, it might have been a few minutes ago when we were singing, which is awesome. For some of you, it may have been a special time in your childhood or a time uh, that you have had experience over and over and over again. Or maybe for some of you, it looks a little differently. But I just want you to jot down a couple of things that make you think about worship. Because one of the things that I've realized over time, and as I was thinking about this passage of Scripture today, is that we kind of get in our head this preconceived notion of what worship is. And, you know, I, most of you know that I've been here at Riverside almost nine years. It'll be nine years this fall. And uh, during this time, I've served in a couple of different roles. But uh, prior to being here at Riverside, I served as a worship pastor. And so as a worship pastor and someone who's led worship ministry and music ministry, I kind of have some ideas of what I think makes a great worship service and what makes great worship music and what makes a great time of worship. I just want you to jot down a few things so you have those in your notes of what you remember about that time when you really spent some time worshiping God and in a place where you really felt like you worshiped him. Then I want you to turn tap or swipe in your copy of God's Word to Nehemiah chapter 12. Nehemiah chapter 12 is where we're going to camp out today. We're continuing in our series called A Time for Prophets. We finish up this series next week in Malachi. And then those of you who are tracking with us in the F260 reading plan, which I hope each of you are doing, we will be in the New Testament in just a couple of weeks, okay? Uh, So we get through Malachi next week and then we jump into the New Testament. And for those of you who have been sitting here through these minor prophets going, oh my gosh, can we ever get to the New Testament? We're almost there, okay? Now, those of you who haven't been joining us, you can jump in right now. There's a reading plan in your bulletin. You can jump in this week with right where we are, and you can catch up later on the Old Testament, okay? And you can jump in right with us as we head into the New Testament, and I think you'll really enjoy the F260 reading plan. Nehemiah chapter 12, looking at verse 27 is where we're starting At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sent for the Levites wherever they lived and brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate the joyous dedication with thanksgiving and singing accompanied by cymbals, harps, and lyres. The the singers gathered from the region around Jerusalem, from the settlements of the Netophites, verse 29, from Beth Gala and from the fields of Geba and Asmatheth, and they had built settlements for themselves around Jerusalem. After the priests and Levites had purified themselves, they purified the people, the city gates, and the wall. Verse 31. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up on the top of the wall, and I appointed two large processions that gave thanks. One went to the right on the wall toward the dung gate. Hosiah and half the leaders of Judah followed, along with Isaiah, Ezra, Meshalem, Judah, Benjamin, Shemal, Jeremiah, and some of the priests' sons with trumpets, and Zechariah, son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Matthian, and of Michaelah, son of Zachar, son of Asha, followed, as well as his relatives, Shemaiah, Azarel, Malachiah, Gilariah, Mal, Nathal, Judah, and Hananiah, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. Ezra, the scribe, went in front of them. At the fountain gate, they climbed the steps of the city of David on the ascent of the wall and went above the house of David to the water gate on the east. The second Thanksgiving procession went to the left, and I followed it with half the people along the top of the wall, past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, above the Ephraim gate, and by the old stone gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hanel, and the tower of the hundred to the sheep gate. They stopped at the gate of the guard. The two thanksgiving processions stood in the house of God. So did I, and half the officials accompanied me, as well as the priests. 
Elikim, Messiah, Minamon, Micaiah, Elohim, Zerai, and Hanai, and the tr- with the trumpets, Messiah, Shema, Elzar, Uzai, Janan, Malchim, Elam, and Azar. Then the singer sang with Zezariah as leader. On the day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and children also celebrated and Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. On the same day, men were placed in charge of the rooms that housed the supplies, contributions, first fruits, and tents. The legally required portions for the priests and Levites were gathered from the village fields because Judah was grateful to the priests and the Levites who were serving. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, along with the singers and gatekeepers, as David, the son of Solomon, had prescribed. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there were heads of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So in the days of Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, all Israel contributed the daily portions for the singers and gatekeepers. They also set aside daily portions for the Levites, And the Levites set aside daily portions for Aaron's descendants. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for this story in Nehemiah. And Lord, I thank you for the way we see them finish this project. And Lord, I pray today that as we study your words, as we study this story, as we think on what Nehemiah must have written down in his memoirs of this time, Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be challenged by your word and that we would be changed because we've been in your presence. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when you think about this story and you look at this passage of scripture, most of you are sitting there thinking, hey, I'm glad I didn't have to read all those names like he did, right? That's why Chris gave me this passage of scripture and he's not preaching this morning. It's the beauty of a two-pastor system. No, Beyond all those names, and you look at this story, you've got to think about what's happening here in this passage of Scripture, right? Remember what happened, and remember what Chris preached about last week, and we see, see, here we have, in this passage of Scripture, we've had a wall that's been built, okay? And in this wall, it's built around the city of Jerusalem. Now, when you think about the miracle that's happening here, Nehemiah was sent by God to build this wall, right? And he had the resources of God to build this wall. But remember how this wall was built. It was built in 52 days. Now, that is hard for me to comprehend. I mean, when I see what the South Carolina DOT does when they take projects, I can't imagine them trying to build this wall, right? If these guys were in charge of the 385 interchange, it had been done already, right? But these guys... We're on a call from God. They didn't have modern machinery. They didn't have the things that help us build things. Yet here they are to build a wall. And I want you to understand that this wall is no small wall around the city. Understand that this wall is large enough, as we see in this passage of Scripture, for them to get up and walk on with choirs of people around. In fact, based on history and artifacts, we know that this wall was about nine feet wide all the way around the city. Now wrap your head around that. For a lot of us, it would take us 52 days just to build one foot of a nine foot wide wall, right? Especially without modern machinery, except for they rebuilt this wall around the city in 52 days. This was a miracle, It was a miracle of God that they got this done. And then we get to this passage of scripture in chapter 12, and I know there's a lot of names thrown in there and a lot of things are happening, but what it boils down to is the wall is finished, the people are there, and here in this passage, Nehemiah says it's time for us to go worship. Look at verse 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sent for the Levites where they lived and brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate the joyous dedication with thanksgiving and singing accompanied by cymbals, harps, and lyres. Now that sounds like a worship service, right? They got together and they said, we're going to celebrate what God has done. We're going to celebrate what God did in building this wall in 52 days and we're going to sing and we're going to bring all the people that play instruments, right? Now, as you can imagine, in this culture, not everybody played an instrument, just like in our culture, right? We love our worship team. We love these guys. We've got a talented group of people, right? But we don't need everybody on this stage because some of y'all can't play a radio. 
But they gathered up some people that could do this, right? They gathered up some people that could sing. They gathered up some people that could help lead them in worship. And they're going to have a party. They're going to have a celebration. Why? Because they saw God do something incredible. Verse 28, the singers gathered from the region around Jerusalem, from the settlements of the Nephites. And we'll go through a bunch of different names. And then after the priests and Levites, verse 30, had purified themselves, they purified the people, the city gates, and the wall. I was reading this passage of scripture this week. And I was telling a few other people this morning that I woke up in the middle of the night last night thinking about this passage of scripture. And this right here stood out to me more than anything else. They worshiped through preparation. These guys had a place where they had to get ready to worship. And they went through this purification process. They went through this process where they got themselves ready. And not just the people that were in charge, not just the people that were going to be leading, but they got everyone ready. They got, they got the wall even ready, right? They went through this whole purification process. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us in our culture. But understand, in their culture, this would have been a huge endeavor for them to atone for their sins and to, to get ritually clean, okay? There'd be certain clothes they couldn't wear, certain activities they couldn't partake in, certain foods that they couldn't eat. All of a sudden, we lost every Baptist in the room, right? When we eliminate certain foods, you can't eat. But they had this process in worship where they worshiped through preparation. They got ready to worship. Now, I know because I am a pastor that I have to come to church most of the time, uh, and I have to be here almost every Sunday, and that's a blessing and a part of my job, but you guys don't have to do that. And I imagine that you guys sometimes have to prepare like I do when you do come to church to be ready for that. And a lot of times it happens to look a lot like my family coming to church. I've got two little girls. And, uh, you know, we live about 25 minutes away. And so it takes us a little while to get here. And on the way to get here, you turn around and look. And Adeline and Eliza are bickering over which movie to watch, right? Now, I didn't have a movie to watch when I was in the car as a kid but they're fighting about what movie to watch and we're trying to get them to calm down and Eliza's got in this place where she likes to take off her shoes and I'm driving to church one day and all of a sudden a shoe comes flying out the back of my head and I turn around and I start fussing Eliza you've got to get your shoes back on what are you doing Adeline's got her bow out of her hair and our family's all falling apart we're bickering and fighting and we get to the church and we pull in the parking lot we get out of the door and I put on a smile on my face good morning how you doing <laughs> glad to see you and then a great day to be at church, right? And we put on this face and we get ready and all the while trying to make sure all of you guys don't realize we came to church fighting in the car all the way here. Getting shoes thrown at the back of our heads and bows pulled out of hair. You see, we have this process that we go through that looks nothing like preparing for worship. worship. It's just for us a matter of getting there. But can you imagine the difference it would be if we took a moment we said, you know what, God, I want you to ready my heart. You know what, God, I don't want all these distractions to be a problem. I want you to prepare me. God, I want you to forgive me for the things that I've done wrong. God, I want you to purify my life. Lord, I want to be ready for worship. They worship through preparation. And then as they were going through the process, as you can imagine, and you look through all this, this huge thing that happens. And the next few verses describe what Nehemiah sets out. And he puts two groups of people together to sing, right? So they're prepared. They're all clean. They're ready to go. They got the wall prepared. It's purified and ready to go. And he sends one group around the wall kind of clockwise from a certain gate to another, right? And they're singing. And they're, they've got their instruments. And it's loud. And it's making a ruckus. And then he gets another group to go the other direction. And they're walking along this wall making a ruckus and singing and celebrating the fact that the wall has been built. And then they all kind of get to the temple. And then it says, the singer sang with Jezriah, the leader, verse 43. On that day, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and the children also celebrated. And Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard from far away. Now, these people didn't pile into a quiet building solemnly, right? They came in shouting. They came in singing. They came in praising. And it wasn't just anybody. Everybody was coming in singing and praising and shouting. And they worshiped through song. 
Now, this is the part of worship that we have no problem with. This is the part of worship we understand, we get, right? We think sometimes in our head, when you think about worship, that's what you think about. In fact, I'd be willing to bet most of you, when you wrote down about that moment that you remember where you really were in worship, there was some kind of musical component involved in this. People sang together. There were leaders, there were choirs, there, was, there were musicians, and they were rejoicing because God had done something amazing. Verse 44, on the same day, men were placed in charge of the rooms that housed the supplies, contributions, first fruits, and tents. The legally required portions for the priests and Levites were gathered from the village fields because Judah was grateful to the priests and Levites who were serving. You see, they got together and they worshiped. They marched around the wall. They were excited about what God was done. They brought all these instruments. They were singing. They were making a ruckus. Everybody around could hear what was going on. And then also, Nehemiah had this group of people that had to show up and do some work. He had a group of men that had to get together and take in what was the tithe, what was brought as offerings and sacrifices, and kind of put them together and organize them so that they could be legally distributed to the priest and to the people that were in charge. You see, these guys had to understand that even as a part of this celebration of the wall, they had to worship through serving. Worship through serving you see i think this is a part of worship that a lot of us miss we show up to church on sunday we walk in about 15 minutes before the service starts we get our donut and our coffee we come to our seat we shake a few hands we sit through the service we say man that was good music i enjoyed the preaching and we go home See, Nehemiah says there's a whole portion here that's going on in the background. There's a whole group of people. Now, these people aren't the people that are singing on the stage, right? I bet these guys that were in the back room in the storehouse couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, right? They couldn't play a lyre. They didn't even know what a liar was, right? But God had a task for them, and they were able to worship through serving God by being a part of helping make this all happen, helping make it come together as a worship service. Verse 45, they performed the service of their God and the service of purification along with the singers and gatekeepers that David and his son Solomon has prescribed. For long ago in the days of David and Asaph, there were heads of the singers and songs of praises and thanksgiving to God. Verse 47, so in the days of Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, all Israel contributed to the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers. They also set aside daily portions for the Levites, and the Levites set aside daily portions for Aaron's descendants. See, these people in this giant worship service, where they celebrated the miracle of what God had done, built this wall in 52 days, they also worshiped through giving. They worshiped through giving. They had to bring something with them. Now, we do that every single Sunday, and we tell you, we want you to give so that we can continue to make messengers of God's grace. They're literally bringing things into the storehouse. Remember, you have those guys that's sorting all the stuff they're bringing? Then they're taking that. There's somebody had to bring that stuff in and give it, right? So they worship through giving. So there's all these different ways that all these people are worshiping and celebrating the miracle of what God has done. And as I thought about this story and I thought about what it looked like and what it must have been like, right? Can you imagine if you had been there, a part of this worship service, celebrating this miracle that God, how exciting it must have been? I can only imagine that people with all their excitement seeing that this wall had been built, they're back in Jerusalem, they can worship freely now, right? They have the protection that they need. They're excited. And they sent people home and they said, get everything we've got. We're going to bring it into the storehouse. We're going to celebrate together, right? We're going to worship. Those of you who can sing, we want you in the choir. Those of you who can play, we want you to play an instrument. We're going to have this huge worship. Those of you who want to serve, we want you to serve and help us sort all this stuff. We want all of you to help give so that we can help pay for the people that are leading us in worship. And they have this exciting time of worship. And then I think, what happened? You see, I see the excitement. And I think, man, it would be so cool to be there in Nehemiah's worship celebration. And when I read this passage of Scripture in verse 12, I get excited and I want to be a part of something like that. And I think, what's happened? Why do we not worship like that? 
Why is that not how we're wired? Why is it as Americans that we come to church only when it's convenient to us? And then I realized these guys are worshiping the miracle that God has done. These guys are worshiping God for providing this massive wall. Sure, these guys had to show up and work. Nehemiah had people that were helping build this wall, but they weren't worshiping what they accomplished. They were worshiping what God did in their midst. And of course they were excited. See, in the American church, we've got this wrong. We think worship's about us. We think, I need to go to church this morning. I, I could use some church. I really need, I really hope worship's good. I hope they sing this song because I love that song. It feels good to me. It makes me feel good when we sing it. It makes me excited. I, I, I hope I get something out of church this morning. Do you realize that in a six-month period in our church, 37% of our people will come one Sunday or less to church out of a month? One Sunday or less in a month for 37% of the people in our congregation. The sad part about that is that is true for every church across this country just about. Why? Because we're so focused on what makes us feel good. We're so focused on, do I like the music? Do I like the preaching? Do I like the songs that they do? Do I, do I like the temperature in the sanctuary? Is the seat comfortable? Is there a great children's program for my kids? And we're worried about us, but my friends, there's nothing more empty than showing up to church to worship and search after something that pleases you. You see, their worship motives were pure. And see, worship motives are far more important than any type of worship methods. Their motives were pure. They were seeking God. They wanted to worship God. And my friends, God has not built a wall around our church. But God sent his son to die on a cross for me and you as a sacrifice for the sins that we commit. The things that I did wrong this week, I don't have to go through some big purification process and sacrifice an animal to be forgiven for those sins. Why? Because Jesus died on my behalf. And my friends, that's worthy of our worship. You see, we've confused our motives. We've come and we want to do what makes us feel good. We want to respond to what makes us feel good. And instead, we need to understand that we come to church to worship God. As a pastor, it's really frustrating. Sometimes I have people come up to me and they'll say, yeah, we're, we're going to, you know, my family's going to the church down the street. And I'll ask them, why? Well, you know, well, did we offend you? Did something happen? Um, you know, what happened? Why, why are you going? Well, you know, it just meets our needs better. We weren't really getting anything. And then I look back and I think, you know what? I don't think you were giving anything either. You see, we have this consumeristic mentality. And as a pastor, it breaks my heart because you know where that's going to take the church? It's going to take the church to empty pews and closed doors. Because we forgot what this kind of worship looks like. My friends, we shouldn't show up and worry about what we get. We should show up and worry about how we're praising God for what he did for us, for the sacrifice that he sent in his son. We should show up and worship God from that perspective. And my friends, we as a church, as American Christians, need to repent for the ways that we have twisted worship. Would you bow your heads all over this room? I said that worship motives are more important than worship methods, but far too often we're concerned about worship methods. We're concerned about what meets our needs. We're concerned about what is happening in our hearts and how we feel and how it makes us joyful or happy or whether we like the programming or not or whether the preaching's entertaining or not. My friends, we need to be concerned about whether or not our worship pleases God or not whether it brings him honor and glory. And so this morning, I just want us to take a few moments and with a time of repentance, 
repent in our heart and pray to God and ask him to forgive us for the ways in which our motives towards worship have not been pure. Would you take a moment right now and pray and ask God to forgive you for the ways that you showed up today even to worship in a way that might honor and bring you glory rather than him? In a way that would honor and bring you comfort rather than bring God glory? Would you pray and repent of that this morning? Would you pray this morning and repent for the ways that you've complained about worship or church or not been faithful to worship in church because you've made it more about yourself than about God? Would you pray and ask God to forgive you for that? Would you pray and ask God to allow your heart of worship to be a heart of worship that solely celebrates him and what he's done? The amazing miracle that comes through his son, Jesus. Would you pray and ask God that that would be the direction and your motives would be pure in worship? just a moment we're going to sing a song of worship again and I hope that through prayer and repentance you can truly appreciate this song not just because of the way you like it or the words you like but that you can appreciate it because you're singing it from the bottom of your heart with joy for what Christ has done in your life but for some of you you may not know that joy because you don't have that peace that comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ if that's you when we stand and sing in just a moment I just want you to head to the back we've got some care team folks they want to pray with you they want to encourage you they want to help you see that hope that comes through Jesus. So church, when you're ready, when your heart is right, would you stand and worship with us?